First John chapter 2, 1 through 6 says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, um, God, this scripture is so rich um, with so much truth, so much encouragement, so much grace um, and care. God, may we just uh, have our eyes turned, turned directly to Jesus. God, would he be made great this morning um, as we see how much better he is than so many other things that we run to. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have all kind of heard about or maybe even been a part of a DTR, a define the relationship. Uh, Maybe you're a little scarred from an experience and you just got a little uncomfortable. Um, But most often these are talked about in dating um, to help really confirm the status of a relationship and align on expectations moving forward. But another prominent area that DTRs are established, if you think about it, is actually through business contracts. And in my job at an advertising agency, my team functions completely on an established contract with our client. When that contract gets approved, agreed upon, signed on the dotted line between the two parties, then we know that we're confident in that relationship. It's secured, it's actually legally binding. We have guidelines of what we will be doing on behalf of the client, so what projects we're gonna be taking on, when those projects are gonna be delivered, how they're gonna be delivered, and then finally it outlines what is to come from the relationship. What will happen if these duties are fulfilled? So how much is the agency gonna get paid? And you know, how long is this relationship even gonna keep going? Is it gonna be one year or 20 years? And if there's ever any doubt of our standing with the client, maybe a mistake's made, then we can refer back to that contract and confirm if we are really still secure in the relationship. Now these contractual relationships do have some good nature to aspects, but ultimately they're gonna fail time and time again because they're reliant on people upholding the standards. And we all know about breaching a contract, a wrongdoing that goes against that agreement and may even fracture that relationship completely. And when that wrongdoing is our fault, we are fearful, insecure, and discouraged. We start to think, this relationship, it's not gonna stand up. And it's all because I messed up. So when we enter into 1 John, John's writing this letter to a group of believers who are battling with that same feeling of insecurity, specifically in their relationship with God. Because they're in the midst of actually a bit of conflict where some people are claiming to follow Jesus, but are also saying that they aren't plagued by sin, that they don't even sin anymore. So he's writing to the genuine Christians in these churches who are being persuaded to follow these erroneous teachings. And he's writing them to say that sin is a direct threat on the assurance of salvation. If not dealt with rightly, sin will impact our relationship with our Father in heaven. But John is reminding us today that we do have assurance of salvation. Our relationship with God is secure. It's established and held together unlike any other relationship. And how do we know this to be true? because salvation has been accomplished by Jesus and will remain intact for eternity for those who place their faith in him. And the first way we know that we have this assurance is uh, assurance of our salvation is because Jesus is our advocate. As it says in verse one, it says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, what is an advocate? 
Well, it's one who speaks in our defense. And if that kind of conjures up this image of a legal um, setting, then that's exactly right. It's an aide or counselor in a legal setting. And this is, this scripture is talking about how Jesus Christ is the advocate before the Father. He takes up the believer's cause before God the Father. Just like it says in 1 Timothy 2.5. It says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. As an advocate, he is the go-between for men and God, with the aim of reconciling the two parties. But why do we actually need an advocate? Well, the answer is that we can't actually be in right relationship with God while sin is present. See, sin is a problem that does have to be dealt with. That's why John is reminding these believers to sin no more, which is something Jesus even said himself. Because when you have a holy God and a sinful man, they can't mix, especially when that sinful man is sinning against that holy God. And in this, this scripture, the, the sin is speaking on, of both habitual, unrepentant sin and acts of sin. Both need to be dealt with. Specifically, sin needs to be forgiven. We see in chapter 3 that practicing sin actually is of the devil, but the children of God flee sin and abide in God. It says in 1 John 3, 8 through 9, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. Forgiveness through Jesus destroys the works of the devil, sin. And chapter 1, right before this passage, talks about how sin can actually be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus is our advocate to speak in our defense to God that we have been forgiven. The forgiveness of our sins when you place your faith in Jesus, it's not a one-time event that only looks backwards at past sins. Then the rest is up to you. It's a one-time establishment of forgiveness that continues to be applied to us as we confess. So when we sin, not really if we sin, we need this advocate to be reminded and assured of the forgiveness that's been given to us. The problem is where we tend to seek for our required advocate. And I'm calling these false advocates. These are things that we might see in culture or might resonate with yourself. One is a chorus of advocates. And that's the people that I choose to be around, choose to be close to. They can testify to how great I am. They say that I'm awesome, that I am I'm a good person. Or maybe it's not even friends. Maybe it's social media where I'm constantly hearing that praise. I pull these people in close just because they see how the good things I do really outweigh any of the bad. And they can speak in my defense if someone starts to question my character. Those that don't see how great I am, I'm going to just cut them out. I'll push them aside so that I don't have to hear that. And if other people fail, then, well, the, the next one is self-advocacy. Because really, when it comes down to it, aren't I my best representation? <clears throat> Since I know myself better than anyone else. We like to declare our own case or declare our own truth. But if we're honest, that truth makes ourselves seem a lot better than we actually are. It's because we're, we tend to lie, omit, or expand the truth to gain comfort, approval, control, or power. Now these, <clears throat> these advocates fail, and they can't assure us. And the reasons being is that the truth is you are stained, and so are the people around you. If our advocate must be righteous, like this verse talks about, then no person can sustain that office of advocate. And secondly, we don't have access to God. There is no admissible righteousness as evidence in that court that can get us access before the Father. We cannot earn salvation. 
And thirdly, we, we don't have eternal life without Christ. So there's quite literally going to be a day in which you can no longer attempt to advocate for yourself. And that's why we need a true and better advocate. You see, there's a, a, a courtroom and you want the best advocate to plead your case when that contract is broken. <clears throat> Jesus' eternal nature, his sinlessness and purity, his righteousness is identical to the righteousness of God. And that's what grants him access to the Father. He has a seat at the right hand of God forever, but even further, he has a perfect, slam dunk, open and shut case that he presents to the Father, that he has accomplished forgiveness. You see, Christ's righteousness has been applied to those who believe in him. We now have the power to overcome sin, just like John is saying here in verse 1. But we also have an advocate to procure a continued forgiveness as we confess our sins. Our sins, they're removed from the accounting ledger. As we repent, we turn from that sin and believe in Christ. We are now welcomed to the presence of God too. And I think it's most helpful to keep thinking about these things in a legal setting because there's this thing called a power of attorney where you grant a particular person to act on your behalf in legal matters when you can't be present. They're your proxy and fully represent you to others. A theologian named Charles Hodge put it this way, the relationship of Christ to his people is that of a legal advocate to a client. The former Personage is the latter, the lawyer stands in the client's place. It is, while it lasts, the most intimate of relationships. You may, not have, you may not even have to appear in court. You are not heard, you are not regarded, you are lost in your advocate, who for the time being is your representative. The advocate, not you, is seen. The advocate, not you, is heard. The advocate, not you, is regarded. And I think it's important that we understand that Jesus is not advocating for our innocence or really even for mercy. He acknowledges our guilt, then actually tells the Father what the law is. He says, yes, can't sin again, but I am his advocate. He is in me and I have died the death he deserves. When you look at him, you have to see me. Justice is satisfied with one payment of this sin, and I have paid it in full. So pardon him and welcome him. So are you trusting in a chorus of advocates around you or in Jesus? Are you trusting in self-advocacy or in Jesus? Because you have continued forgiveness through Christ's payment of sins, flee sin and abide in God. And how did he pay for these sins? Through his sacrificial death. And that's where we see in verse 2, we have assurance of our salvation because Jesus is our propitiation. And that is a big word. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What is propitiation? It means to make reconciliation by the means of sufficient payment for sins. The payment owed for our sins is death, and the Bible's very clear on this. That broken relationship with God could only be made right with the perfect payment, God's wrath for sin fully satisfied. And it says in Romans 5, 8 through 9, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. What we see here is that Jesus is that sacrifice that writes the relationship with God. His wrath is satisfied by Christ's sacrificial death. But instead of turning to Jesus as our propitiation, we turn to other ways and means. And these are false propitiations. Areas where we place our assurance of love and acceptance other than Jesus. The first one is my own perfection. This is the idea of works-based righteousness. Do I do all the things expected of me? Go to church, read my Bible, pray. Am I a kind person? Am I accepting? I'm not rude. 
If I do all the right things, then I have feathers in my cap. I have gold stars, I have trophies, I have report cards, all for the purpose to try and have assurance that God loves me. Second one is my own success. How good is my life going? Is my prosperity in this world proof that I am blessed and loved by God? And this one is sneaky because it's rampant in the Western church culture, and that's why it has a name of prosperity gospel. We all desire to improve and have a better life, so we take the Bible's promise of blessings and plant them in material things instead of the person of Jesus. So we understand our relationship with God in terms of what we have, not who we have. And the third one is maybe my sorrow, my sacrifices, the sufferings. What have I had to sacrifice in life? Or what sufferings have I had to walk through? I've been formed and shaped into a stronger person. I've persevered through the valley, so to speak. And in fact, aren't these sufferings a form of propitiating for my sins? Because sufferings equal the wrath of God being dealt out, right? You start to think that the sufferings I've encountered make me more holy. I'm more acceptable to God because of the ways that I've suffered. And then maybe you're like me, where all three of these resonate deeply. These all fall short and cannot bear the weight of assurance. Perfection falls short because all have sinned. There's no such thing as perfection apart from Jesus himself. Even our righteous acts are like filthy rags because of sin. There are not enough trophies, physical or metaphorical, that can prove us as righteous. And success falls short because salvation cannot be earned. It's so clearly written out in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. The prosperity of this world is truly like chasing the wind. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And my sacrifices and sufferings fall short because God's wrath has already been fully satisfied. And they are not in themselves the way of eternal salvation or acceptance by the Father. You see, we have a true and better propitiation. Romans 3, 23 through 26 says, For there is no distinction... For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. God was manifested to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not sin, but was perfect hence being called the righteous. Jesus himself became the propitiation for our sins. Notice that it's not an external means of propitiation that God chose to use, but he did it through himself because that's the only way that it would work. It was done once for all. It was a one-time sacrifice that was sufficient. And it was for all, not that everyone will be saved, but that Christ's death results in forgiveness for all those who enter into relationship with him. I'm curious if anyone here has ever paid off a car. I, I got the pleasure to do that one time. Uh, they give you the pink slip. It, it gets sent to you in the mail. You get it in the mail, and you're like, wow, I actually paid for that car. And there's nothing else that is owed to the bank. They're, they're not going to accept my money. But imagine if I just keep checking that statement balance, keep offering to pay a little bit just in case there was a mistake and I still owe something. Now, if you don't believe in Jesus, this type of behavior makes sense because you don't have assurance that the debt is paid. And actually, the debt isn't accounted for as paid yet. You are still responsible for the penalty of your sin. But if you are in Christ, stop trying to pay the bill. It makes little of what Christ did on the cross. He has paid all of your debts. He is holding that pink slip 
that proves your salvation and he's waving it in front of you to say, you are mine. The stress and burden of that debt owed is completely lifted away. We can rest assured in his sufficient payment. Jesus has made a promise to you that what he did on the cross, paying the penalty for your sins, is finished. So I implore you to lay down your pride, repent from your sins, and abide in Jesus because he laid down everything for you. And this covenanted relationship is experienced and proven as true when we follow him and become more like him. And what we see in verses 3 through 6 is that we have assurance of our salvation because Jesus is our example. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This section is a call to become more like Jesus. As we know Jesus more fully by following him, we will be assured in our salvation. And how do we come to know him? By keeping his commandments and abiding in him. Keeping his commandments is evidence of the grace of God in our lives. And as we obey, it proves our love of God. It takes what we know to be this factual assurance that he's our advocate, he's our propitiation, and it turns it into an experiential assurance. We have assurance of saving faith as we behold and become more like Jesus because God's love is perfected when it accomplishes that purpose of transformation. The Bible talks about how the life of a Christian is marked by changed behavior. Not that the behavior earns anything, but it is produced from a new heart. That's why it talks about the fruit of the Spirit and a heart of flesh being replaced, or or a heart of stone being replaced with a heart of flesh. You have a new heart that changes the way you behave. And John is clear of what the commandments are that we need to keep. 1 John 3, 23, it says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. But we are expert breachers of contract, are we not? Because our hearts are naturally turned towards disobedience. See, the scriptures really want us to have assurance of our salvation, but also go really far to be heavy on those who are disobedient to not allow them to have assurance. This passage talks about two paths, one of truth and one of a liar. This true, authentic belief delights in God's commandments. And we see this so beautifully in Psalm 119, 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Keep going. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The other path is one of a hypocritical liar who opposes God's commandments. And John says it's impossible to believe in Jesus and oppose his commandments by action. In fact, Jesus says this himself. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, for some of us here, this might look like I am a Christian and I trust God, but 
going to church is not a priority. I'm a Christian and I trust God, but I'm not generous with what the Lord has given me. I'm a Christian and I trust God, but I'm in charge of my own body and what I do with it. I'm a Christian and I trust God, but I speak ill of my brothers and sisters. I am a Christian and I trust God, but I don't actually talk about the good news of the gospel with people. We fail in so many ways, which is why we need someone to show us true and better obedience. That true and better, better obedience is in Jesus. Jesus, as the perfect example, he's devoted to our eternal relationship. And here are just three examples of many where we see Jesus' perfect obedience. John 8, 28 through 29 says, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And then in Mark 14, 36, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to go to the cross, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then in Philippians 2, 8, talking about that that moment on the cross and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, he did the ultimate act of obedience, and it's what assures our salvation. How does Jesus obey the Father? By abiding in him and his love. John 15 says this, that if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Therefore, because Jesus has obeyed and his Spirit is now in us, we too can obey by abiding in him. Because drawing near and abiding in Jesus produces the fruit of his Spirit. And I like to think of this like gears and how they work. There's one main gear and then other smaller gears around it, and they're all connected. And when they turn together, when the main gear is turned, but if one of them is out of alignment or broken, it causes a slippage where the the teeth of the gear don't actually engage properly, and it goes in and out of sync. When we are turned by the gear of God's love, the gear of our love for neighbor begins to turn in like manner. And does the, uh, as does the, the gear of generosity and the gear of self-control and the gear of patience, and it goes on and on. Deliberate and persistent disobedience to God's law is an indication that our hearts are out of alignment. There is a slippage in the gears. A slippage in the gears reveals a disconnect in the link, and it tells us that our hearts are not actually abiding in God. So what in your life is and is not lining up with what you claim to believe? Where do you oppose God's commands to love God and love one another? Abide in Jesus. Know who he is and what he did by pouring over the scriptures, praying for a deeper love for him and walk in obedience because it gives us confidence that we know and love him. Being in alignment is for your good because as we abide in Christ, we are assured of salvation. So here's where we have hard truth to confront. We will all have to stand before God and account for the ways in which we've disobeyed him. We've broken that covenant We've chosen to turn elsewhere for our assurance of salvation. And when these other means fail, we may question if we really have any assurances left. But this you can be assured of. Either you'll have to stand before God and self-advocate for your righteousness and self-propitiate for the penalty of your sins, or you can rely solely on Jesus as your perfect advocate who never fails and gives you his righteousness when standing before the Father. 
You can rely solely on Jesus as your perfect propitiation who endured the cross as the penalty for your sins, cleansing you so that you can be in the presence of God for eternity. And you can rely solely on Jesus as your perfect example who obeyed the Father in every way so that we may know him and become more like him each and every day. <clears throat> Whether you've been on a, a zip line or a, a bungee jump or a ropes course at a, a, a camp, there's this point where you have to trust in that rope. Right before you jump, you have this thought of, is this rope truly going to hold me? Can it bear the, the weight? Is it enough? Can I trust it? If the answer is, I hope so, then you should not be taking that jump. <laughs> and yet, some of us are taking that approach to standing before God by relying on self rather than turning to Christ, who is the most reliable assurance. Salvation is assured in Christ alone. He is enough. So who will you rely on? Who will you rely on? Will you rely on Jesus and what he has done for you? Or will you rely on yourself? Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we see that you are true. You are better. Jesus, you have accomplished salvation for us. It is assured by your work alone. God, we have done nothing to earn your grace and your mercy. God, when, when we are in the, the midst of sin, we know that we can turn to you. We can turn to you as our advocate who says, forgive him. We can turn to you knowing that the penalty of our sins is completely paid for. And we can turn to you as an example for how we live in light of that good news. Jesus, would you impart that on our hearts today? We thank you for your word. Amen.